we're going to start with Christian Hen, and um, he's talking about the beer commercial and the paradox of masculinity, coming from the Maryland Institute College of Arts uh, and headed towards an MFA in photographic and electronic media. We're going to start off with uh, some commercials. Men should act like men, and light beer should taste like beer. Milwaukee's best light. That flavor in that's going to increase the depression right now. That little dog. <laughs> you need this fluffy little doggy. Come here, I'll rub your little belly. Yeah. <laughs> men should act like men. Yeah. <laughs> men should act like men. Yeah. <laughs> men should act like men. And light beer should taste like beer. Milwaukee's best light. <laughs> Uno de cada diez hombres argentinos es gay. Gay, hey, animal gay, 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 sí. Uno de cada diez hombres. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, diez, ocho, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, diez, diez, ocho, nueve, ocho, diez, opa. Prepare for St. Patrick's Day. Lesson 412, man hug. Approach with caution. Arms outstretched. More. Good. Adopt the A-frame, leaving at least half a foot between crotches. Never nuzzle or smell a man's hair. A firm pat indicates we are finished. And finally, strike a casual pose. Not that casual. Lesson complete. 17th of March, the friendliest day of the year. In all these advertisements, the use of humor is intentional but always referencing the transgressions of ideal masculinity as a manual of how to perform. Judith Butler described that gender is a performance, and a performance that was not prescribed by individuals acting alone, but rather in accordance to certain measurements of acceptance. Through selected beer advertisement campaigns in the post-millennial era, Butler's notion of the performance can be visibly seen and critiqued on what perspective the term masculine really means through the direction of behaviors. If gender is a performance, it bears repeating itself in order to define our gender roles. However, through Jill Deleuze's inter interpretation of using humor and irony, men can free themselves from repeating conformity, thus changing the perspectives of what constitutes accepted masculine behavior. Lance Strait's 1992 essay, Beer Commercials, a manual on masculinity, he addressed how through the beer commercial myths of masculinity are depicted by defining male existential relationships between their environment, themselves, boys, and women. The commercials that Strait analyzed were steep in the theme that Stereotypical men overcome challenges they face through discipline, control, and support of your fellow man. It is through these commercials, the performative act of mastering masculinity can be observed through various strategies that display the ability of males to control any situation or circumstance. However, there seems to have been a paradigm shift on what certain beer advertisers thought constitutes ideal masculine behavior. Milwaukee's best men should act like men campaign is an extreme form of this shift in which performing outside the parameters of acceptability results in repetitive punishment. 
The most ironic thing about the campaign is that retribution comes in the form of a light beer can. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, it informs us that misrepresenting masculinity comes with some form of retribution that parodies violent acts in order to correct one's behavior. There is nothing especially troublesome going on here. Five lengths of orange and yellow plastic tubing descend through the center of the photograph. The tubes are protected by a simple and unthreatening configuration of metal pieces, kind of like a child's erector set. The environment surrounding this unpretentious arrangement is typical of the bland American institution, complete with dingy white walls, scuffed linoleum tiling, and that familiar vinyl floor trim. On the one hand, this image is totally decipherable. Its details are explicitly on display, centered, straightforward, uncomplicated. It is plain, benign, yet I believe that this image behaves so strangely that it could disrupt our sense of the contemporary world. I would like to talk to you today about the imperceptible politics of the photograph and the aesthetic experience. And when I speak of the aesthetic experience, I am not only speaking about the way things look or about style or the beautiful and the sublime. I speak of a particular kind of relationship between visual sensation and meaning. What happens during the aesthetic experience which is the moment in which we behold a visual object, like the moment we are having now with this photograph, what happens during the aesthetic experience is that on the one hand we can understand what we're looking at, but understanding does not quite account for all that we sense. It is as if we can see more than we can say. This photograph is titled Transatlantic Submarine Cables Reaching Land VSNL International, Avon, New Jersey, and it was made by Taryn Simon. It is a part of her series entitled An American Index of the Hidden and Unfamiliar, a chronicle of various sites in the United States that can be accessed only by people with special privileges. Like many photographs, it comes with a caption to help us understand its contents. These VSNL submarine telecommunications cables extend 8,037.4 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, capable of transmitting over 60 million simultaneous voice conversations. These underwater fiber optic cables stretch <coughs> from Sutton Sands in the United Kingdom to the coast of New Jersey. The cables run below ground and emerge directly into the VSNL International Headquarters, where signals are amplified and split into distinctive wavelengths, enabling transatlantic phone calls and internet transmissions. This is actually only about half of the caption, but we're going to leave it at that for now. So um, the caption helps us to understand a particular history that relates to the photograph. But importantly, that history is indecipherable without the text that we've just read. The image is also an abstract plane of visual information, visual facts, we could say. We can simultaneously understand the objects contained in the frame and also appreciate them as mere forms and colors, lines of gray, orange, and yellow. <coughs> What we look at is the record of the visible skin of a reality, but that is it. The facts that we see are only visual facts, emptied of their substance and their history until Simon intervenes with her carefully researched caption. As we stare at these banal visual facts and contemplate the history for which they stand, life is turned into art. The ordinary becomes uncommon, familiar yet strange, boring yet beautiful. This aesthetic experience signals to us that the image is not merely a visual vessel for facts. 
I would like to suggest, in fact, that this aesthetic experience is a tender moment of oscillation that is crucial to the politics of the photograph. It is in this moment that the photograph can twist free from the meaning that is habitually assigned to it. Most of us encounter photographs every day, several times a day, perfect little visual vessels of facts. Photographs allow us to know about people, places, and histories that we cannot actually encounter in our present time and space. The photograph's unrelenting resemblance to the facts that once passed before the lens makes the stakes of its appearance critically important for what we perceive of these bodies, topographies, and histories actively defines possibilities for comprehending the distant horizons and private folds of earthly existence. Imagine that all of the images we encounter in the news, in advertising, in snapshots, on Facebook, as information for products, science, history, legal evidence. Imagine that they compose a chain of images that define reality, that allow us to locate ourselves, that give us a picture of the world and what is possible in that world. But this picture is limited. It is culturally coded. But we cannot quite see that coding clearly because we are too inside of it. Its blind spots and distortions are also our own. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to share with you a short paper that includes two artists who center their artwork on the gender nonconforming body, both in video and performance. Though this paper is the surface of such an expansive topic, it is a burgeoning critical inquiry that is of great interest to my work as a beginning art critic, art historian, and also a person. Um, <clears throat> when did nude become this color? Uh, while it is often trite to use an entry from the dictionary, we can all agree that language and specifically naming is very powerful. In fact, the Oxford English Dictionary describes nude as of a person or part of the human body or its representation in art, etc., wearing no clothes, naked bare. Of course, nude is also defined as plain, without adornment, or empty. But for this 2013 shoe, its color is nude. Not light beige, not cream, but nude. This example assumes a standard for nude, for skin color, which analogously can be applied to a standard for gender. This analogy does not disregard or conflate racism with trans and gender nonconforming phobias. It is important, however, to state that both erasures of other people's bodies are present and thriving, and to recall that the two can be applicable to one person. In 1977, Lucy Rigoré published her book, The Sex Which Is Not One, also the title of the second essay in a text that caused quite a controversy. She was actually kicked out of the university for it. Rigoré argued that female sex genitalia had thus far been understood as a receptacle for the, a receptacle for the male sex genitalia. Her essay was both a summary of years of Western oppression on the female body, particularly her genitalia, and a statement that the female body slash genitalia has a wholeness which had yet to be culturally accepted or understood. And she says, for women is traditionally a use value for man, an exchange value among men, in other words, a commodity, as such remains the guardian of material substance, whose price will be established in terms of the standard of their and of their need desire by subjects, workers, merchants, consumers, Women are marked phallically to fathers, husbands, procurers, and this brand determines their value in sexual commerce. Woman is never anything but the locus of more or less competitive exchange between two men, including the competition for the possession of Mother Earth. 
but women do not constitute, strictly speaking, a class, and their dispersion among several classes makes their political struggle complex, their demands sometimes contradictory. There remains, however, the condition of underdevelopment arising from women's submission by and to a culture that oppresses them, uses them, makes of them a medium of exchange with very little profit to them, except in the quasi-monopolies of masochistic pleasure, the domestic labor force, and reproduction. And though this text may seem antiquated or even not applicable to the main craze of this paper, I believe it is imperative be to begin with a nod to the history of claiming the body as unique and whole. The claiming of one's body, its safety and representation, specifically how gender, uh, or contemporary gender nonconforming artists use their bodies as the center of artistic inquiry and expression is a central focus of this paper. The image that you see before you was a, a picture that I took at the Atlanta International Airport. And here we have two gender helpers, just in case you get confused. <coughs> One, pink is for girls and blue is for boys. And two, women are triangles and men are rectangles. Contemporary culture typically conflates sex and gender as one and regards male and female as a clear binary. Even in postmodern academia, there is debate in regard to sex and gender. Some argue that they are inseparable, others not. Though presumptions of biological sex or cisgenderedness is part of how the body is interpreted, it is more pertinent for this inquiry to examine gender as an important and valid personal construction, separate from sexual binary and or sexual multiplicities. Gender, too, has a myriad of interpretations. There is the proverbial umbrella of gender nonconforming, as defined as any body that is outside of that binary, a body whose presentation does not fit gender normativity of male or female. Contemporary gender nonconforming artists use their body as the artistic medium in order to dismantle this normativity and prejudice, to turn those aforementioned binaries inside out. One must argue that gender, and specifically the gender nonconforming body as used in performance, offers multifaceted engagement. In turn, there is voluntary involuntary dialogue about the gendered body elicited by the voluntary involuntary exchange between the performing body and the body of the viewer. Prior to continuing this inquiry, I must address that as a queer, femme identified, cisgendered white female and ally, I understand that I am in the position of speaking about someone else's body, a body I do not inhabit. This is a delicate area and must be approached with utmost respect and the acknowledgement that I can never speak for another, but I could only do my best to be continually conscious of what it means to be an ally. So basically, these three papers were really pulled together because of their focus on the impact of language verbal and textual in the discovery and projection of content, whether it be meaning or identity. And uh, if um, you guys would have questions to start off, um, hopefully in that vein in the beginning, that's where we'd like to take it. Uh, right in front of the camera. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I've got questions for Jordan. Um, first of all, I really like how sort of Bartz and Franciosi and Lucy all really resonated in your work. It was really interesting. Um, in that vein, I think uh, in Towards the Philosophy of Photography, Lucy talks speaks a lot of this dramatic <coughs> confusion you try to kind of demonstrate here. And for him, it is a product of kind of a confusion between intention and channel. So would you say that the examples you've given are really this, this dramatic confusion caused by an imperative intention to <coughs> transmit it through an optative channel. That is, I mean, you know what I I don't actually, I'm not um, familiar with this there. So um, I actually draw a lot more upon Jacques Rossier and right. Kant and, um, and um, Foucault and Judith Butler in that paper. Um, <coughs> so are you asking about the, so the kind of the some kind of line between the intention of the artist and the it's and not the intention experience. of the artist as much as what the apparatus transmits of the intention that mm -hmm. was given to the photograph 
right. through the way it was it was taking, mm -hmm. and it's the way it kind of collides with how it actually is presented and yeah. the channel through which it is presented. Mm -hmm. And then for Flusa, it was three kinds of intensions and or channels, mm -hmm. which are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really hard to kind of apply that theory to right. real life, but then he goes ahead and does it anyway. Um, and he, well, basically what you say is a really good demonstration of his dramatic confusion of how, right. yeah, you can do something. <laughs> um, yeah, so okay. I was wondering. Um, well, I think there are, I, I hope that I address this because I'm not as familiar with the theory, but um, but I think that there are there are a variety of different things going on, which of course have some kind of overlap. Um, one, the language, both the visual language and the verbal language that Simon adopts is is something that is drawn upon from scientific work, right? It has this very square view, um, so. This is the kind of capacity that the photograph has because even though it's presented in a fine art context, because we view photographs, you know, everywhere all the time, we have this kind of way of apprehending them. So the photograph can really borrow from other photographies, um, even when it's in a fine art context. So that's one kind of mode that affects, I think, the apprehension of it. It's a kind of language that Simon is using. Um, but I think that the the idea of the aesthetic experience is that in order to get the meaning from it, um, one, it's really about the active viewer, right? And so, and so by kind of with even though, in one way, Simon presents us with this excess of meaning, right? This you know, I'm showing you, I'm telling you. But at the same time, there's this experience of I actually am not getting the information that seems to be here, and that creates the the active viewing experience of the aesthetic experience, and so the the ways in which a viewer kind of has to come to or arrive at what that meaning is for them. So I hope that I hope that okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Well, I actually have one, so I'll go. Um, basically, I wanted to know, with the, for you and also for Chris, when you when you discuss the uh, the construction of gender and how the when you identify individuals, everyone has a very specific way of identifying themselves, which is their right, and um, but the specificity of that language, does that also maybe lead to a, a lessening of the deference for privacy and the need to continually describe yourself? I think that's a, I think that's a pretty good question, actually. But um, in my experience as being part of the queer community, um, it's pretty often the case to when you meet someone to ask what pronoun they use because there's such a plurality of pronouns and gender, claiming one's own gender. And even though these, these notions of, of understanding one's own gender are not new, but we're in this position in the contemporary world where we have this possibility to reclaim language, to define that language, and to change pronouns, you know, and to have that freedom for it. So I think, I mean, just as just as if, you know, when we talk about race, you wouldn't just assume someone was was a race based on the color of their skin. You would ask if you were to refer to them, like how would you prefer to be referred to? Um, pronoun usage is the, is exactly the same thing. But I also think it varies between person. Um, uh, for me, uh, and for a lot of people that I know, it's always like, how do you what are your pronoun preferences? You know, but um, and some people could care less, and some people care very much. Can I just make a comment um, about this, which is that um, uh, the pronoun that that you use in even that description, of course, is I, yeah. and so there's this moment where the identification with a with an I right. uh, has uh, is gender neutral. Yeah. Uh, and um, so when you ask somebody what pronoun do you prefer, 
you're already you're it's, it's very interesting the way you're full you're you're changing the space of one's self selfhood into how one's perceived right. like you can call me she or you can call me he but it isn't it's it's um, it's a very interesting way in which to throw out into public I mean this is where this this question seems very important, right. that, the, that the essential privacy, let's say, of the consciousness of an I <laughs> right. um, cannot be, uh, is not in a shift space in relation to the regards of others. Right. So there's a lot of, in this, in this mm, complicated address that you brought to us, that there is a kind of way in which the mirroring um, uh, has an enormous amount, seems to have a huge, uh, um, an under, an, a very big impact that we're inside a certain kind of mirroring going on, yeah. even if it is not the same mirror as everybody's used to looking into. Right. Yeah. And, and again, you know, when you end up speaking about someone else, um, without ha letting that person speak for themselves, you end up claiming an identity for them that they... Yeah, and there's also the question of names, which I think is even more interesting than pronouns. Not to go too far, but I, I, have, I know somebody who's in the midst of, um, of a, a change, uh, and um, she is, has a feminine name, yeah. and we asked her, are you going to keep your name? And she said yes. I mean, that's uh, what so Tara that's, did as well. Yeah, you know, so Tara. that's very complicated it, in itself, yeah. right? Right. Any other thoughts? Do the panelists have questions for each other? Feel free. I have a question for you. <clears throat> I was curious about, um, in the commercials, how, I mean, on the one hand, there's this, you know, this kind of, this showing of the policing of norms, mm -hmm. um, but how they also, are so conscious of the construction of norms, you know, mm -hmm. um, that it's, you know, it's kind of not the same as, as making them kind of the invisible background of the, right. the commercial, but that they were so, you know, conscious of that there was a policing of norms happening in the commercial, and I wonder if that's like, if that's a newer thing, or if that's been happening, and kind of how mm -hmm. how to deal with that that awareness of the policing in the in the work. Um. Well, like I I think this sort of like I talked about this paradigm shift from like the '90s and '80s commercials where it was more about like where men, you know, we can control everything no matter what circumstances to no, we're going to make sure you're a man now because <laughs> you should behave like one. Um, I think part of that is sort of, I, I mean, uh, uh, interesting kind of way that uh, the, the shift's kind of gone in the way commercials are. I mean, number one, the issue is an advertisement gets your attention in 20 seconds and the next one's on. So there's no real time to think. It's not like looking at an art piece. You you can soak in the meaning of what this means. It's sort of subliminal. and despite its shortness, um, I think it does have a huge effect on its audience. Um, and this shift, I think, uh, it sort of talks about this strange paradox, maybe that the problem is that masculinity, or you know, what pe they're, they're trying to define this masculinity, they, they just can't anymore, because I think this is sort of this push and pull um, with several things, like first, um, Feminism, um, the criticism was that men were, you know, to uh, ask, you know, that they were um, like trying to, you know, present themselves as like they control the world, right? So that I think the advertising strategy was to use irony as a way of like, well, you know, this is just a joke. You can't criticize us anymore for the way we portray mm -hmm. how men should be. And, you know, and I think that the issue is that. This is sort of having, this does have some effect. I mean, um, despite some changes in politics, I mean, even here in Chelsea, people still get bashed. Uh, 
and it was kind of weird because after I guess like uh, marriage had been passed in the state of New York, these hate crimes kind of went up. It was like you know what's going on. This was kind of seen as a bastion for LGBT people, and we are finding it's not. And I think this this has particular effects, particularly in youth. Um, other commercials that um, I, I just saw the other day, it was a Slim Jim commercial. It's like, you're not a man unless you eat a Slim Jim. I mean, that's so, the, the absurdity of this. But at the same time, it's like, these are young adolescents who are trying to define themselves as male, um, slowly being affected by this sort of, I don't know, negativity. Like, they, the, the only way you get to choose and define what a male is by telling the other people who they're, they're not like you. And I think that's a huge, huge issue that, um, that our kind of society and culture has to confront with. Um, I think kind of touching on what you were just talking about, uh, uh, I was wondering in either your essay and or like further research on this, um, do you discuss the effect and or the, the production um, behind these commercials, like as because they're there to sell something, right. so they are selling your gendered identity, so to speak, through product. Um, and so I was wondering, uh, like via your essay and or further research, are you exploring like the commodification of that and the production labor behind that, and then what that entails, and kind of taking that spin on it. Um. Not that much. I mean, I'm more interested in the cultural and societal effects of what imagery and like this works. I mean, that's why I think I I have an interest with um, Deleuze's like idea of repetition, um, which I feel like can be sort of pro you know needs in my opinion needs to sort of be explored more because um, seeing things over and over again has its own effect. Um, but I mean, I. For me, it, uh, yeah, it has a specific purpose, is to sell this and to try to gain the attention but um, of a certain demographic. It's obviously for um, people in their 20s, 30s, I don't know, um, young male professionals or young male um, uh, working class. Uh, and, you know, they're aired specifically during sports. Um, I have no issue of it being like this sort of, that it is an advertisement, that they're trying to get their product up. The question is how they're doing it, and that's the issue for me. It's, it, it's not the issue of you know, the, the involvement of the capitalism in part of it. Um, the, and the thing is that how do, you, how do we as a society learn to accept different forms of masculinity and incorporate that within the context of advertising. That doesn't become detrimental for the other people who don't fit within that realm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it occurs to me one of the things that all of the three papers have in common um, is less really about identity uh, and, and even about images, but, but really where, we, where, lo where the location of consciousness is um, at, in a kind of general way. Like where is where is awareness and consciousness and how does it affect the making of meaning? Because all of you are, are sort of interesting, there's an interesting kind of open space between a, a place of objectivity, a place of subjectivity that's, that's very mutable right now. And inside of that subject-object mutability, which language upholds in its syntax, is, um, is a very fluid uh, condition of consciousness. So the question about where are you aware of what, what they're thinking about behind the scenes of that ad that they're making, how much consciousness is there is really what the question is, right? How much, how much well, a uh, huge amount is mm -hmm. the answer, right? They're totally aware of what they're trying to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I, think, I think it's very, it's systemic. It's, I, there's, you know, it's systemic. I chose a specific type of commercial um, because I think the history of it was interesting because there was, there was, this is not a controversy in the past, you know, the, the idea, how it was advertised. But it's sort of systemic because when you see the commercials, it's like, maybe, maybe they're all, I haven't done the research whether it came from the same firm or anything like that, but they're replicating this style of advertising to 
um, this male demographic, and I and I don't think it's a good strategy at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes? I'm sorry, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. you. You title your paper the bit more on the paradox of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't really see where the paradox is. What, where is it? What, 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 what constitutes the paradox? The paradox is what, how do you define masculinity? And the paradox is, okay, so then uh, as my, uh, Mark Kimmel um, talks about, it's like, well, Adolescents cannot define what a masculine man is because they can only point out what homosexual men are. And when you ask them, what is a man then, it's always whatever, what they aren't based on the homosexual man or the perceived effeminism of men. And I think that it's is a paradox. Defined by, by, by negative, not right. right, right. And so is that, is that how you want to defi make definitions? I, I don't think that's a proper that definition. Is that paradoxical, though? Is that, does that have an inner contradiction? How is that a paradox? The contradiction is with like how, I think, I think it's a contradiction in how males seem to define themselves. Because it's, it, it is not a definition. What you're not is not a definition. A definition is what you describe of what you are, not what you're not. Um, right. Well, I think there's a paradox, too, if you're just going to have masculinity in the definition be not homosexual in the sense that, mm -hmm. for instance, in the commercial you showed, you showed a homosexual relationship that were assuming traditional gender roles, although they were between two men. So right. one of the males had a very masculine set of behaviors and characteristics, even though by definition he couldn't be masculine because he was cohabitating with another man. But he's still expressing that same type of behavior that the beer commercials are propagating. Right. Yeah, and actually, to to go on to that, I mean the the paradox is that um, these notions of what is feminine and what is masculine are like this is what masculine is, this is what feminine is. But the reality is that there's multiplicities within what is masculine and what is feminine and we're conscious of that and we're aware of that when we're inundated with images and popular culture that reinforce this statement of this is masculine this is machismo this is male it's paradoxical because that's not it it's a fallacy in and of itself and it's it's not really the reality um, at all. I'm sure you know maybe you have some machismo persons it could be of any gender um, I also think that the the string between all three papers is this this problem of definition, like the problem of defining one's gender or one's masculinity, or the problem of defining meaning within um, within multiple means of communication, either through um, text or through photograph. Um, what what defines like what what do the cables define? Do they define transatlantic communication? Do they define globalization? Do they define technology? Um, and like, has that has this problem entered your papers in terms of um, definition itself and the problem of definition? I know it, it came up most in yours, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like the meaning behind, like I know there's the separate um, and what Simon does with the photographs is the separateness between um, what is presented and what it and what the backstory is, um, but who. I guess it's more like an agency of like who defines the backstory and who defines what the photograph actually is supposed to be. I um I think that w what you touch on pretty much what my motivation is my deeper motivation for looking at photography um, and just the failure of taxonomy for accounting for the actuality of what's going on here in existence, right? Um, <laughs> and so the ways in which photographs can make it seem as if, you know, or media, you know, popular culture, any, the ways in which it can seem as if there were these clear distinctions between what kinds of people there are on this planet and what their capacities are, who, you know, who is capable of speaking and who is capable of working and, you know, um, any way that we want to kind of divide up populations or things or um, 
anything, uh, the ways in which they don't work. And I think the moment when we when we confront in a photograph something that our the taxonomy we come with, like our you know system of knowledge, can account for what's in the photograph, is um, a moment where there's the possibility for a kind of rupture. Um, but even that said, I, I also feel, even though I would like to maintain the possibility of that kind of rupture, I also, um, I also wonder if that kind of rupture is actually impossible. <laughs> and so, um, and I, I feel, I mean, you know, I wrote my paper and whatever, and then I'm here, and then I'm actually in this place of questioning a lot of things. And so, just to argue up the other side of it, I think, um, and uh, there is, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with John Tagg's work on photography. He kind of, he writes this book and he keeps bringing up this thing, like throughout the book, which you're kind of like, why is he saying this over and over? And he says, um, what, on what condition would you, and take me seriously, he says this, would you believe in a photograph of the Loch Ness Monster? Um, or we could say a UFO or whatever. And I think the point that he's trying to make is, um, is that if we don't already have a condition of being able to believe in something, um, no amount of evidence in front of us is actually going to make us think that that thing is is true. So in other words, the kind of when photographs present us with a kind of taxonomy, or even if they would resist that kind of taxonomy, the knowledge that we come to the photograph with is already defining what's possible for us to see in that photograph. So whether it's possible for us to believe in that kind of masculinity or a certain kind of body or um, a certain kind of capacity, or whether it is possible to have a rupture of our taxonomy for accounting for the world, I think I, I'm not so sure that we can, that we can rupture it, but I, I really would like to believe in it. <laughs> uh, Jordan, how, is, how are those photos, like using the photos of the cable, different from a ready-made object? What's <laughs> different? Because to me it seems it's sort of the same thing you're playing with an object in a different context, and then you have this like hidden meaning, which is not in uh, my apparent. Yeah, well, just where your analysis, vice versa, ready made objects. Um, well, I think that's a very interesting question. I think it's, it, there is a difference in that it is a photograph, and so it's a, a representation that's speaking in a way in a certain kind of language about historical evidence. I think. It would be different to have, well, if you actually brought those cables into this room and said, these are the cables, right, that are going all the way to the UK. Um, in a way, I think, if you were doing the same thing where you were crossing it, making it cross the line from life into art, it was a ready-made object, not an actual, you're no longer supposed to interact with it as you would in regular life, then I think in a lot of ways it could do a lot of the same work. Um, whether or not it's possible to have the 60 photographs as 60 ready-made objects that function in the same way, I mean, <coughs> um, there are probably some differences that we would have to contend with, but I think the kind of root of what happens when something in the ordinary world crosses that line between us apprehending it as something that we would use versus apprehending it as now it's an object of art and and it's something to contemplate what else it is besides what it usually is when we encounter it is um, there's a similarity there between photography and the ready-made I think. Do you think um, that that part of what you're saying is has to do with um, some split space in photography uh, between the notion of intentionality, because like, I think we have to assume that all photographs have behind them a photographer, so somebody has intended to take the photograph, and then, and then 
and then the way in which they spill into the culture as if they were value neutral. In other words, as if yeah. they left behind their intentionalities. And then they ask the viewer to, yeah. to ascribe to them. I mean, you use this very strong, I wanted to ask you about it, you use this very strong word. Um, I think you said photography is the unwitting accomplice. Oh, I didn't say unwitting, but it's, it or is, unwilling? I said, uh, yeah, the, the, yes, I know what you're talking about, I can find the word, but yes. So accomplice of the real, is that something what you said? The, and so, so it's become a natural accomplice to the limited lens that defines reality. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. who, what's the, the so, if I, so there's neutrality mm -hmm. in the reception space, mm -hmm. or ostensible neutrality, like mm -hmm. the, their acts of nature almost. Mm -hmm. There's inten intentionality mm -hmm. on the part of the, the mm -hmm. photographer. And then there's this peculiar thing, that, this word, this very mm -hmm. hot word that you used, mm -hmm. which is accomplice. Yeah. Um, can you kind of move around in that configuration a little? Sure. Um, so I think, I mean, this has haunted the, history of photography, right, is that from the moment it's invented, it seems to be, you know, sunlight is making an image that as if there's no, it's a machine, there's no person, there's right. no, and it's, you know, it's absolutely, it's, it's like, it's not true, it's right, of course, right. but, um, and many photographers have tried to, tried to take themselves out of the equation that was, you know, I mean, I think, Walker Evans is an interesting example of a photographer who kind of first was experimenting with that. Um, and um, so, so the person can't take themselves really out of the equation. And there are ways, of course, we can talk about, you know, there aren't unmanned cameras, but there's still some kind of, some, they're somehow belonging to our human system, right? Um, but it does happen in the reception of the photograph that it's as if it was a machine and we still inherit this today you know and and it, it's hard not to inherit that because it does duplicate what's in front of the lens so it's it's very difficult not i mean even as somebody that completely deconstructs this all the time i still go to amazon and i look at my product and i'm like that's what it's gonna look like you know i believe it you know and when do we not believe in it it's it's um Difficult. Oh, but anyways, as the unwitting accomplice, I think I didn't address that part. But yeah, so so it it's been inscribed in kind of our narratives of history, our you know Loch Ness monsters, if you will. You know, it's like it's there, and then it comes to confirm ideas that are already, I would argue, a part of our our cultural norms. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so thank you all for coming. Thank you for speaking.